Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Orgo Sengupta, and I'm the research director of the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you to Vidhi's fifth annual lecture to be delivered by Justice Edwin Cameron, former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Before I introduce Justice Cameron and the annual lecture itself, uh, we have a very special presentation. Uh, at Vidhi, we believe that the Constitution of India is only a living document if it is taken to the people. And it can be taken to the people in diverse ways. With this goal in mind, this year we organized a student podcast competition on making the Constitution more accessible to the people. And in the process, make young law students think about their role in spreading the message of the Constitution, not just through doctrine or dogma, but through chats and conversations, because there are a number of ways in which the Constitution's message can be spread far and wide. We had a, had a difficult time in selecting three winners, uh, but we managed to, to, to narrow it down to three, uh, whom we would like to uh, commend today for their tremendous efforts. Uh, they have not only made themselves, uh, but the framers of the Constitution of India very proud on this India's Republic Day, the 72nd day, uh, year uh, of India's Republic. Uh, so, Maitre, can I just ask you to play some snippets of what our winners came up with? Um, so first we have Sanjana and Sparsh, Maitre. Understanding the values that, a, that the constitution has is hmm. much more empowering when it comes to exercising your rights and knowing the constitution as opposed to knowing the provisions themselves. Yeah, yeah for example, even France, you know, France is a very mature republic. But even they have changed their constitution four times in the 20th century itself. And yet, mm -hmm. the French leaders often talk about uh, the values of the Republic and all those things. So clearly, it's, it's about conveying the ideas and epistemology of the constitution as opposed to constitution itself. So, you know, you can almost rephrase the topic and say that it is about taking constitutionalism as opposed to constitution to the people. So next up, we have Ranu Tiwari. School curriculum has a major role to play, I believe. Although there are textbook, textbooks that inform students about the constitution and how it was created, they are largely limited to class 11th and 12th humanities students. And finally, we have uh, Kabir and Aditi. Because the constitution and the public sphere are so interlinked, it inevitably implies that they're, uh, they're like learning a lot about the constitution through the internet. And this, this in fact was exemplified uh, uh, especially because uh, if you look at channels or like Instagram accounts such as Brute India or or even uh, news channels such as The Wire, they they do give a lot of insight into the constitutional matters. And, and it in fact, as a student also, I can attest to that. And social media platforms has helped me a lot to learn uh, about the constitution and has added to my knowledge of the already constitutional law knowledge that we get from law school. So there you have a brief snippet of what our, our students in the first and second year of law school came up with in their podcasts that take the constitution to the people. Uh, so congratulations to all those who participated in this. We'll be working with uh, these three fine young minds, actually five fine young minds, uh, in, in refining their podcast further and spreading the message far and wide and some gift vouchers coming your way as well. Uh, so congratulations to all. Uh, we hope that you'll keep the flag of the constitution flying high. On to the Vidhi annual lecture. Set up in 2013, uh, it is our belief at Vidhi that governance in India can only improve structurally when we have better laws and systems to implement those laws. To this end, we do original research on new laws, amendments to old laws, work with civil society organizations to advocate for these laws, and finally work with governments to actually draft them. Real systemic change requires cooperation amongst various stakeholders and diverse viewpoints where we must constantly work with each other, sometimes oppose each other respectfully, but always learn from each other. The annual lecture provides us a moment to step back and reflect. In the past, we have had Justice Ruma Pal, one of the most widely respected judges of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Chalameshwar, now popularly called the chief dissenter of the Indian Supreme Court in recent times, Justice Gautam Patel, who I see has, has joined us today, 
uh, and Justice Dama Seshadri Naidu, who were judges of the Bomb- who were judges of the Bombay High Court, who have set high standards of propriety and erudition. This year, we are thrilled to have Justice Edwin Cameron to continue this fledgling and promising tradition. We are doubly thrilled, as I said earlier, to do this on India's 72nd Republic Day, 72 years from the day the Constitution of India came into being. One of the first legal lectures that I had read when I was a law student about the age uh, of our podcast winners was the Tagore Law Lecture from 1939 which was delivered by Justice William Douglas of the American Supreme Court. And I remember his lecture clearly. It was titled uh, From Marshall to Mukherjee, Studies in American and Indian Constitutional Law. And I remember when I first read it, I I was wondering right at the outset, like how could two gentlemen who were separated by two centuries, one John Marshall from Pennsylvania in the United States in the early uh, in the uh, late 18th and the early 19th century, and Justice B.K. Mukherjee uh, from the founding cohort of the Indian Supreme Court in the middle of the 20th century. What could possibly connect them? And at the end of the lecture, I was left pondering the converse question, which was that how could they possibly not be connected to each other? Such was the power of comparative ideas of the Constitution. That is why it's my singular pleasure today to have Justice Edwin Cameron today as our first Vidhi annual lecturer, who is an international lecturer and talking about issues, not only that are of relevance to South Africa, but to democracies everywhere. Justice Cameron will be speaking on the subject using constitutional text and vocabulary to resist unconstitutional actions. I think we have We all have much to learn about this subject. This is particularly the case since Justice Cameron will be preaching on a subject that he has practiced for the better part of his life. From 1986, Edwin Cameron has been a human rights lawyer based at the University of Wits in Johannesburg, where in 1989, he was awarded a a personal professorship in law. His practice covered areas including labor and employment, Defense of the African National Congress, freedom fighters charged with treason, conscientious and religious objectors, land tenure, forced removals, and LGBTQ rights. From 1988, he advised the National Union of Mine Workers on HIV AIDS and helped draft and negotiate the industry's first comprehensive AIDS agreement with the Chamber of Mines. While at WITS, he drafted the Charter of Rights on HIV and AIDS and uh, co-founded the AIDS Consortium, which he chaired for its first three years. He was also the founding director of the AIDS Law Project. He oversaw the gay and lesbian movement submission to the Kempton Park negotiating process. This, with other work, helped secure the express inclusion of sexual orientation in the equality clause of the South African constitution. In September 1994, President Nelson Mandela conferred the status of senior consultus or senior counsel on Edwin Cameron. Mandela appointed him an acting judge and later a judge of the High Court. In 2000, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal and then a justice of the Constitutional Court in 2008, where he served until his retirement in 2019. During his tenure, he's delivered many judgments. And as a BCL student in Oxford, I had the singular pleasure of reading some of them. But I'll end this rather long introduction with one. Uh, And I end it for a reason with this one, because on 25th November 1949, in his final address to the Constituent Assembly, Ambedkar famously expressed the idea that the efficacy of a constitution depends not on its content, but on the manner in which it is implemented. And Ambedkar stated, and I quote, however good a constitution may be, it's sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it, work it happen to be a bad lot, unquote. Seven decades later, on the 20th of August 2019, in his last day as a judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, Justice Cameron echoed the same sentiment while delivering what was to be his final judgment in Bekintela Mewalase and others versus the Director General of the Department of Rural Development. He spoke candidly of the Department of Rural Development's failure to fulfill its obligation to labor tenants. As a result of the department's unwillingness to process applications filed for restitution of land, labor tenants were left with no redress. In an order that I found 
particularly spectacular in terms of how he negotiated the institutional role of the court and its limitations as a judicial organ. He restored the decision of the land claims court, appointing a special master for labor tenants to assist the department in its implementation of the LTA. Justice Cameron said, and I quote, it is not the constitution, nor the courts, nor the laws of the country that are at fault in this. It is the institutional incapacity of the department to do what the statute and the constitution require of it that lies at the heart of this colossal crisis, unquote. Like Ambedkar, Edwin Cameron was expressing a simple point. It's always the people who work the constitution who must be held to task. That is something he has done all his life. And I'm delighted that he is here today to share some of that experience and deliver the fifth Vidhi annual lecture and share those learnings with us. He will also, uh, he has also accepted that he will take some questions at the end of his lecture. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll try and take as many as possible. The fifth Vidhi annual lecturer, Justice Edwin Cameron, over to you. And just thanks, Dr. Sengupta, for your very generous and thought-provoking introduction. This is a great honor for me, and it's an honor edged with particular distinction by my colleagues from the Delhi High Court, as you've mentioned, from the Mumbai, Mumbai High Court, uh, and from the Supreme Court of India, and particularly the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. I'm honored, colleagues, by your presence here this evening. And I am particularly honored to be giving this fifth annual VD lecture. Uh, I'm delighted that I was given the honor of the invitation uh, and also through the Oxford connection with Dr. Sengupta and uh, Mr. Uh, Rahul Bahaj, Bajaj also. So uh, this is a great pleasure. And I want to commend uh, the Institute, the Center for Legal Policy, uh, the VD Center, for all it does, uh, you've explained in very brief terms what it does. There's an enormous range of important interventions that you and your staff make. And it is a great pleasure for me to seek in a small way through these remarks to contribute to the, word, to the work that you are doing. And I start off on a somber note. It's a tough time. It's a very tough time on the northern border of, of India where China uh, has, has threatened the world's largest functioning democracy, which is India. It's a tough time in Eastern Europe where uh, another autocratic state uh, threatens the democracies of, of Western Europe. And it's a tough time in my own country where uh, after nearly 28 years of democracy following 350 years of apartheid racist oppression, uh, our capabilities as a functioning democratic state are under severe attack. And of course, uh, you quote uh, Justice Douglas, Dr. Sengupta, in the United States itself, uh, democracy is under attack, not just from the rabid gangs that attacked the capital a year ago, a few weeks ago, on the 6th of January last year, but also, I fear, by judges themselves who have uh, come onto the bench with a rigid, hard right, far right wing ideological agenda. Uh, that is not the subject of my talk tonight, but I think it is important to emphasize that what I'm going to be speaking about is the role of judges. And if judges, I will come back at, in my conclusion to what I believe judges should do. Uh, I have isolated in my life, 25 years on the bench in South Africa, uh, two principles which I will return to. And I might say uh, that I have been honored and thrilled to make six visits to your country at the invitation of the Mumbai Lawyers Collective, my comrade and friend, uh, Mr. Arnold Grover, and his spouse, uh, Senior Counsel Indira J. Singh, and uh, to make those trips each time with Justice Michael Kirby of the Australian High Court, since retired. So my respect for Indian democracy, my respect for the profundity and the learning of the Indian judiciary, and most important, my respect for its courage are profound. 
Going back to my somber opening, the COVID epidemic of the last uh, 22 months seems to have triggered a global decline in freedom. The, the pandemic exposed weaknesses in all the pillars of democracy, fake news, misinformation, uh, bogus elections, threatened threats to freedom of assembly and movement. Through erosion of democratic norms, strong men, and they are always men, regrettably, have taken center stage and set their faces against constitutional values. This led Farid Zakaria to coin the insightful concept some decades ago of illiberal democracies. Democracy, which functions but does not become liberal simply by having a democratic process for elections. Even societies that do not protect individual property rights, those with state monopolized media may be democracies, but a democracy may therefore be illiberal in curtailing rights and freedoms. What Zakaria advocates instead is constitutional liberalism, a system for protecting individual autonomy and dignity against coercion, whatever its source. And that, that is the concept I will return to right at the end of this lecture. This foregrounds the importance of individual liberty and the rule of law. And of course, one key feature essential to liberal constitutionalism is what we've been talking about, an independent, impartial judiciary of integrity, a judiciary of open-mindedness, and a judiciary of courage. In the current turmoil undermining democratic values, we must zealously nurture independent, impartial, and courageous judiciaries. In illustrating this in the next 25 minutes, I focus on how the South African Constitutional Court, which as our program director indicated until two and a half years ago, I was part, has grappled with and held democratically elected President Jacob Zuma to account. He sta stands accused of grave acts of democratic damage and subversion. But let me go back a few steps to concepts that will be familiar to many lawyers in India. We came out of the apartheid era almost 28 years ago. What was unique about apartheid was not necessarily the amount of blood that was spent in its defense, but its nature as a uniquely brutal legal system, a system minutely, finely regulated, regularized, systematized, and enforced through the law. There was a parliament, law, judges, and even a constitution, but the legal system that, uh, uh, provided for rule by law, not rule of law. The demise of apartheid brought an end to this, an end to parliamentary supremacy, and an end to the executive-minded positivist judiciary that for the most part, but gloriously and courageously, amongst a minority of the white judges under apartheid, did not support it. A Supreme Constitution was inaugurated under President Nelson Mandela in 1994. And the Constitution moral legitimacy rests on two features, its aspirational founding values. These include human dignity, freedom, equality, and the rule of law, enshrined in a robust and justiciable Bill of Rights. These include equality and other protections for religious and religious belief and religious practices. And I don't say that lightly. I know that I'm speaking with some resonance to what is happening uh, in, in, in India at the moment. The second foundation is the promise of the fulfillment of these values and rights. It's not enough to have a constitution. As you rightly said in your introduction, it depends on those who implement it. And part of the implementation of the South African constitution depends centrally on whether we are going to address the dispossession, the inequality, the division and the subordination that we inherited from apartheid. The Bill of Rights is our chief strut and the other key features include separation of powers, limitations on the exercise of public power, division of governmental power at three levels, local, provincial, and national, and then the constitutional court, the new court, set atop the old apartheid judiciary 
as a guardian of the new constitution. In the early years, there was almost euphoria under President Mandela, a brave visionary, probably the most uh, famous prisoner in human history. He was overruled within two years of his presidency in an important enactment by the court. And he said he welcomed this because it established the primacy of the law, even above his own power and the own power of his, of his recently elected democratic government. He revealed his deep commitment to the constitution. And of course, when uh, our new democracy was threatened by disease, disease that initially brought me to India, when we feared that there would be a mass AIDS epidemic in the subcontinent of India, which never eventuated, thank heavens. When we were beset and still are, we have 7 million people living with AIDS and HIV in South Africa, some 13% of our population. President Mbeki plunged us into a nightmare of AIDS denialism and the courts again took charge. They challenged the, the treatment activists and the treatment action campaign, challenged President Mbeki's healthcare policies and courageously and in fidelity to the constitution, the constitutional court gave a unanimous ruling requiring President Mbeki to start making antiretroviral treatment available. And today, I'm proud to say that because of brave activists, because of the rule of law, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, and because of brave principled judges, we now have in South Africa, the world's largest publicly provided antiretroviral treatment program. I'm one of some 6 million people whose life depends on my taking as I do every morning, my antiretroviral treatments to suppress the AIDS virus. So this was a judicial victory, but it was also an important victory for civic activism. And that is one thing that we in South Africa have in common, the civic activism that saw Indian democracy eventuate in the late 1940s has been sustained under Indian democracy. And the same is true in South Africa. It was widespread civil disobedience, widespread independent community organization, non-governmental organization, organizational resistance to apartheid, and that has persisted. The court has ruled against the president and executive power in many deeply contested politically charged cases. We set aside in a case in which I participated, President Zuma's very first appointment, uh, ahead of the head of the National Prosecuting Authority, because he had ignored findings that his nominee or his appointee was, had lied in public. It invalidated legislation in a judgment that I jointly authored with Deputy Chief Justice Dikhang Moseneke, uh, invalidated the legislation that scrapped the independent corruption busting entity, thereby bringing into domestic law the international undertakings that the South African government had pledged to uphold, namely anti-corruption measures with sufficient independence. We said those weren't just out there in the international sphere, they also applied internally, locally, municipally. The court has proved to be a robust, independent and impartial institution vindicating the constitution. But we have a problem, as I said, in the United States, they have a problematic form of president. We also have a, a problematic form of president. President Zuma, succeeded four years ago by President Ramaphosa, he seems determined, Zuma, to subvert the court's legitimacy and its authority, and in his own selfish interests, to erode public trust and confidence in the judiciary as a whole. His lawyers cynically employ what we call Stalingrad tactics, where you use every unscrupulous ploy in the law to avoid determination of facts and issues that you, that you wish to evade. In a trilogy of cases that have sought to hold former President Zuma to account for his alleged criminal defaultations, he has tested the bounds of what a committed court should do in the face of malfeasance by a leader who wields enormous public power. During the Zuma years, 
fraud, corruption, and capture of state enterprises. On a gossipy level, and I say this only as a quick gossipy in insert, for the benefit of and through the instigation of a family that came from India, the Gupta family, fraud, corruption, and state capture became rife throughout the public and private sectors to Zuma's associates, the Gupta family. They created a shadow state in which public contracts, tenders, and procurement were exploited and state entities and institutions were hollowed out. This prompts some question. What role has the court played to combat corruption and state capture? And how has the court remained firm in its resolve to hold the excesses of a defiant leader committed to seeming, and I say it seeming because he has evaded trial until now, seeming criminal defalcations. First, a brave and principled former public protector, Ms. Tuli Madonsela, issued a report in which she required that President Zuma should pay back part of the enormous sum illegally appropriated to be spent on his private residence. He treated the report with open contempt and the court in a resonant judgment, I was proud to be part of it, articulated by a particularly outspoken Chief Justice at the time, Chief Justice Mokweng, unanimously found that in doing so, Zuma had failed to uphold, defend, and respect the constitution as the supreme law of the land. It foregrounded his role. I said in public, and Chief Justice Bukwing rather enjoyed this, I said that he had delivered a sermon to the nation on civics and on civic responsibility. He told the president what his job was, and the president didn't like it. The court ordered him to repay part of what was unlawfully spent and appropriated on his private homestead. Commentators hailed this as a victory for democracy. But now the big tests followed. Part of the remedial action the public protector had ordered was to validate the appointment of a judge to head a commission of inquiry into state capture. That happened in early uh, 2018. Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo was appointed to a commission that is only now, four years later, wrapping up its work. Through all the arduous work of the commission, which was obviously directed centrally at his conduct as principal executive officer of the constitutional state of South Africa, President Zuma adamantly evaded cooperating with or participating in its truth-seeking mission. Neither the commission nor Zuma backed down. The impasse inevitably landed before the constitutional court. I had left, so I was not a participant in any of the dramatic decisions that followed. The first question was, should he be compelled to appear and testify before the commission and obliged to answer it questions? In the first case, Zuma won, the court unanimously said, Yes, this hinged on the proper interpretation of an apartheid era statute that empowers commissions to subpoena witnesses and to require them to answer questions subject only, question by question, to the privilege against self-incrimination, which applies in India as much as it does in other developed uh, rule of law states and democracies. Zuma was not entitled to take a blanket uh, exemption from appearing before the commission at all. He was ordered to obey the summonses and the directors of the commission, but he didn't. That gave rise to a grave crisis. The commission approached the court in Zuma II, and the court found in favor of the commission. The court was in a precarious position, it said. Former President Zuma had undertaken calculated and insidious efforts to corrode the court's legitimacy and authority by refusing to participate and to obey its order. Never before, said my colleague, my brave, outspoken and courageous colleague, Justice Sisi Kampepe. She said never before has the legitimacy of this court nor the authority vested in the rule of law 
be subjected to the kind of sacrilegious attacks that Mr. Zuma, a former president of the Republic, has elected to launch. Never before has the judicial process, Justice Kampepe said, nor the administration of justice been so threatened. The language the court employed evidences its alarm. Its alarm. Zuma was peddling his disdain for the court. The court speaks of a real and imminent risk of its being made a, a mockery. His recalcitrance poses a threat to the rule of law. His orders cannot simply be disobeyed. The court describes his conduct as, quote, an insult to the constitutional dispensation for which so many men and women fought and lost their lives. It concluded that his contempt of court, his blatant of contempt of court, required an appropriate response. The judiciary, it pointed out, has no constituency, no person, no sword. It is nevertheless obliged to rely on its moral authority. And that lies at the heart of my lecture this evening, Mr. Program Director. The only mechanism by which the, a person defying the court can be held to account is through the contempt process. Because of his stature, an exemplary sanction was required. The court divided on this sanction by nine votes to two. The powerfully unified voice was smirched by a virulent dissent by Justice Teron and Justice Jafter concurring. The majority said that in view of the blatant and flagrant contemptuous refusal to obey the court's order, a sentence of imprisonment was inevitable. A merely coercive order requiring President Zuma yet again, after all the preceding orders, to obey its order as it had already ordered would be, as it said, futile and inappropriate. The court imposed a direct and unsuspended order of imprisonment for 15 months. The two minority judges railed against this concluded conclusion, scandalously imperiling the authority of the court. They claimed that its order was unconstitutional. This to me was an excessive uh, 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 diversion into rhetoric because I'd given a judgment in the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2006, which on many occasions had been upheld by the Constitutional Court against all kinds of public authorities. And that judgment said that the contempt mechanism was available to a court and should be exercised sparingly, of course, but was available. Suddenly, the two dissensions said no, the contempt inquiry and imposition of sanction had to go through the criminal process. And we know that President Zuma has been defying the criminal processes for the last 15 years already. So what the minority were up to uh, is a, a genuine matter of legitimate, grave, troubled inquiry. The majority lamented that respect for judiciary and its processes alone ensures that peaceful, regulated and institutionalized mechanisms to resolve disputes prevail. If with impunity, litigants like Zuma are allowed to decide which orders they wish to obey and which not, our constitution is not worth the paper it is written on. The court held that Zuma owes the sentence imposed upon him for violating not only the court's dignity and authority, nor even just the sanctity of the judiciary as a whole, but he owes it to the nation he once promised to lead and the constitution he once swore to uphold and to obey. Tragic events ensued after a perilous period of indecision and ambivalence, not unlike the same period after the Constitutional Court some years ago ruled against President Mbeki. There was a perilous period of days when it was uncertain whether President Mbeki and his health minister would obey the treatment action campaign judgment on AIDS drugs. After a perilous period, Zuma did go into jail, but he at the same time invoked his oldest, dearest stratagem, his artful lawyers.
they approach the court to rescind its freshly delivered judgment. Perhaps regrettably, and in this scholarly forum, this dignified forum, together with other judges and Indian constitutional lawyers, international lawyers, we can say that perhaps this was regrettable. My own view, and it's not based on any inside information from my existing colleagues and contacts in the court, is that no doubt they agreed to set down the challenge to the order just delivered because of the hostile expression of the view of the minority, perhaps hoping that the minority would say, well, we lost last time, precedent, rational defense of precedent requires that we obey what was decided. Perhaps astonishingly, none of that happened very, very sadly. In the midst of these dramatic, unprecedentedly dramatic uh, judicial events in the middle of last year, President Zuma's supporters instigated a vast insurrection which was mainly confined uh, to Durban, the highway leading out of it on the main artery to Gauteng, which is where I'm sitting, South Africa's economic and main population hub, about uh, 600 kilometers away. More than 300 people died. I should tell you as well that we have a significant and influential minority community of South Asian origin, uh, largely founded with Tamil indentured laborers brought over at the end of the 19th century, and later with mercantile uh, uh, voluntary immigrants, largely Gujarati speaking people of, of, of Islamic background, Muslim background. And there have long been tensions which Zuma supporters uh, exacerbated in this time against the Indian community of South Africa. We call them an Indian community. They should be called an Afro-Indian community. It's shorthand, which is used widely, even in the South African Indian community itself. Amidst all this death, there were rising rabid racial tensions, a tremendous setback for our democracy. The third case was a reprise of the previous cases. The court split on the same lines. Justice Kampepe, again, courageously and eloquently reiterated the fundaments of her previous judgment, and the minority simply used the occasion to reiterate their earlier rejected minority stand on the punitive sanction. They claimed that President Zuma had uh, met the requirements for rescission of the previous judgment. It is my respectful view, uh, certainly my pronounced view, uh, an, an indefensible and untenable view that the minority took. Where does this leave us? Uh, and I'm now, let me check the time. I want to, uh, I'm trying to figure out the time, Mr. Program Director, because we are three and a half hours behind you. No, I, I think you're doing very well. well. You, you can speak for at least another 15 minutes. You have 15 minutes okay. to get up to 35. I, I, I will, I will uh, it's now 15.53 South African time, and I will try to finish off in the next 10 minutes. Uh, sure. So, some pressing questions present themselves. What do we make about claims made by President Zuma of the politicization of the judiciary? Can the rule of law and constitutionalism flourish without a capable state, one that is committed to implementing the social promises of the constitution? And what lessons are there for judiciaries who may contend with defiant leaders like former President Zuma. As for politicization, criminal syndicates operating from deep within President Zuma's office during his tenure as president, 2009 to two, beginning of 2018, they almost destroyed many of our key accountability mechanisms. These included the National Prosecuting Authority, the State Security Agency, and the Public Protector, which has placed immense pressure on the judiciary. The seeming counter-majoritarian dilemma, I believe, is often overstated. Both the text and the structure of the constitution unavoidably demand of the judiciary, as the Indian Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of India itself has repeatedly pointed out, 
that it resolved disputes that its detractors will seek to claim politicize it. In every obvious sense, the judiciary is not inherently political. Judges cannot and should not take over the governance of a country. There are rational and prudential limits on what judges can and should do, deference, capacity, knowledge, and expertise. While judges have no direct accountability to the electorate, they do have considerable power. And how do we reconcile that? The fact is that in any complex democracy, the majority exerts power through a complex web of mechanisms. The simplistic model of citizens congregating in the Agora in Athens, and the next day the democratic majority decision is implemented, doesn't exist in any cognizable form in, in any sophisticated democracy. And part of the democracy in any sophisticated democracy is necessarily the need for an impartial institution of integrity to determine the rights of the citizens, the limits of public power, and who is right and wrong in any dispute, whether private or private and public. These must enable governments, governance, but they must also enable oversight, scrutiny, and limits upon exercises of power. In addition, uh, the program director mentioned uh, the inclusion of sexual orientation in South Africa's cons constitution. I, as a proudly gay man, had a part in that, and I'm part of a minority. To its enormous and undying credit, the Supreme Court of India, in a resonant judgment, a judgment that resonated across the entire globe, recognized the rights and the, the protective needs and vulnerabilities of India's LGBTIQ community. And I'm very proud uh, as a lawyer and as a fellow judge to note how important that judgment was. Where do minorities stand subject to the power of the majority? Intrinsic to the nature of democracy is protection of minorities. Delineation of power thresholds and scrutiny of the exercise of legislative and executive power demands that there be an arbiter. What about judicial overreach or conversely abdication? Four crucial decisions determined the boundaries of Zuma's exercise of presidential power before, uh, while he was in power. One upheld the ruling, I've already mentioned it, that required him to pay back the money. The second ruled that parliament had the power to vote in secret when he, a motion of no confidence was brought against him. The third ordered parliament to initiate measures and rules to enable the impeachment of the president, section 89. The court here again divided sharply. Then Chief Justice Mohen, in the opening sentence of his dissent, disparaged the majority judgment as a textbook case of judicial overreach, a constitutionally impermissible intrusion by the judiciary into the exclusive domain of, of parliament. I was part of the majority of that judgment in December 2017. The majority hit back trenchantly. It pointed out that its ruling does no more than interpret the impeachment provision in the constitution itself. Can parliament, which is required by that provision to set up rules and processes, if necessary, to determine whether a, a president warrants impeachment, can parliament ignore that requirement, the majority said no. It pointed out that to attach a disparaging label to an opposing view does nothing to further the debate. While judges should exercise restraint, and more particularly, Mr. Program Director, judges have to act with pervasive and inner humility. Performing the job of judging cannot amount to overreach, whether one agrees or disagrees with a judgment. The bogeyman of separation of powers should not cause courts to shirk from their constitutional responsibility. Judges know that they have to act with restraint, but when the constitution obliges them to act, they cannot remain silent. The division of the Duma judgments revealed the court at a time when it was under attack and rendered it vulnerable. 
dissenting judgments, as the Supreme Court of India and the high courts in India itself know all too well, can strengthen a court's legitimacy, buttress independence and transparency, may strengthen the majority judgment, respond to anticipatory critiques of the outcome, encourage deliberation. But a dissent shouldn't really simply ridicule the majority judgment or undermine its legitimacy. In the Zuma trilogy, which I discussed, the dissents, particularly the unsubstantiated calumny that the majority judgment sending President Zuma to jail was unconstitutional, seized upon by his uh, anti-constitution supporters. Those calumnies were employed by Zuma to undermine the court's authority and finality. The insidious attacks have been continued, requiring acting Chief Justice Zonda, himself now a candidate for permanent appointment to the Chief Justiceship, together with Judge President Lambo, President of the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, Mandisa Maya, and Justice Buiseli Mutlanga of, of the Constitutional Court, Justice Zonda noted that more tax attacks would be on their way. One of the central things, uh, Mr. Mr. Program Director, and I'm now drawing to a close in the next uh, four or five minutes, is the question of a capable state. What are the requirements for the rule of law? The one is obviously an elite, a political elite that is willing to accept the authority of the courts. That President Mbeki uh, manifested when he accepted the outcome deeply repugnant to him of the judgment requiring him to start making antiretroviral treatments available. So you need elite and uh, power uh, buy-in and submission by, uh, by, by the political and corporate and populist elite. You also need popular legitimacy. But thirdly, you do need a constitution, and this goes back to your thoughtful introduction, Mr. Program Director. You need a constitution that actually works for the people, a constitution that demonstrably inhibits abuses of power, a constitution that in our case, with social and economic rights, as in the case of the right to health care, a constitution that demonstrably delivers rights to those who have been deprived of them for too long. And for this one needs a capable state. That in many ways is our major crisis in South Africa. A capable state must root out corruption, ensure competent public appointments, ensure decisive leadership, improve basic service delivery. And a, a further, uh, I just see from my notes now that a further condition for the success of the rule of law is what I mentioned earlier, that we both have historically in India and South Africa, is an active, a clamant, uh, 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 and I say this with particular humble knowledge of what is happening in South Africa, what is happening inter alia to the Lawyers Collective in Mumbai, a clamant, assertive and courageous civil society sector outside government. Those are uh, an indispensable precondition for the success of the rule of law. Let me take a step back in concluding. What might constitutional courts and similar democracies derive from the sorry saga of President Zuma's attempted destruction of the rule of law in my country? First, to ensure that defiant and recalcitrant leaders act within the discipline and the constitution of the law. Constitutional courts, Supreme Courts, apex courts should have the intent, resolve and courage to hold these leaders to account when called upon to do so. The oath of office ties them to the supremacy of the constitution without fear of repercussions. Second, the fact that a dispute has politically charged consequences and, and implications is no escape from judicial oath. Third, and here I return to my theme, humility and restraint. No political embroilment, embroilment should occur unless mandated by the law or the constitution. Let me conclude, Mr. Program Director. 
What a fine phrase, guardians of the constitution. That's us, put up our hands. We are the judges. What does it mean? I promised you at the outset that for me, it means two things. In my judicial career, I thought that judges should do two things. The first is to be suspicious. I could say skeptical, scrutinizing power. Every judge everywhere should always be suspicious of power, government power, corporate power, populist power, trade union power, legislative power, non-governmental organizational power. Power in whatever form it manifests itself should be approached with reserve, with skepticism, and even with suspicion. It must be scrutinized to see whether it is lawfully mandated and whether it is justly exercised. Secondly, and this returns to my theme, the second principal pillar of my judicial philosophy, to use a grandiose word, and I apologize for doing that, protecting the weak and the marginalized. This includes the unhoused, the incarcerated, the dispossessed, but it also includes minorities, religious minorities. It seems strange to speak about the Muslim minority in India when it exceeds in number uh, any other. Uh, uh, numerate uh, accumulation of, of Muslim observant people anywhere in the world, linguistic and cultural minorities, gender and sexual orientational minorities. A famous defense of the rule of law, one very well known, might be worth quoting in conclusion. It's from the enthralling play by Robert Bolt, A Man for All Seasons. Sir Thomas More chides William Roper who suggests that he would be able to bend all laws in order to fight evil. Sir Thomas says to him, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? Roper, I'd cut every law in England to do that. Sir Thomas More, and when the last law was done and the devil turned on you, where would you hide, Roper? the laws all being flat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice Cameron, as in for, a, for a truly uh, inspiring speech. As in, I think there is a, there is a lot uh, that we have to reflect on, uh, and particularly uh, your example of what happened in the Zuma case is, is extremely instructive on how the constitution can both be a tool uh, to speak truth to power, uh, but also be sometimes a bit blunt and perhaps not sharp enough uh, if it's not worked in the way it should. And I think there's lessons for, for all of us. And, and, and I can already see that there are many questions starting. So if uh, our attendees would like to ask questions, please feel free uh, to put them in the chat box. Uh, I, I certainly have, have a lot of thoughts in my head. Uh, so I would uh, abuse my position uh, as, as moderator to, to perhaps start off with one. Uh, and perhaps this is a slightly theoretical question, uh, but you use the phrase, uh, and I quote, the bogeyman of separation of powers. Uh, and the reason I say this is because in India, uh, this question comes up quite often uh, in terms of what is the rightful role of a judiciary. And we all know Hamilton, uh, and the Federalist Papers saying that judges neither have the purse or sword, uh, it's only judgment. Uh, so given the fact that the judiciary, obviously by virtue of the fact that it's an unelected body uh, has certain limitations, well, in your experience, where do you see the judicial role ending, particularly in cases where the executive is recalcitrant and doesn't want to uh, abide by those orders because this is a this has always been a debate in India as to how far can the judiciary legitimately go. So I just thought maybe you could reflect a little bit on that uh, while the questions keep coming, and then I'm going to take a few. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to take a few uh, questions, uh, and and maybe we'll take a couple together, and then you can uh, you can take them. Uh, so Professor Subin Bhatnagar, who's one of our very respected vice chancellors of a national law university, asks that in view of the fact that the Zondo Commission has found that the government could not be trusted to curb corruption, 
what should be done to avert the possibility of this happening in the future by any other president, given the way the, the entire Zuma proceedings transpired? Perhaps is it a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. or is it another judgment? So perhaps you'd like to take that and then we can go on. Yes. To yeah. Mr. Program Director, I'm very grateful for that question. I think it, it, it chimes exactly with what you've raised. How far can judges go? And my view is that judges can't go all the way. You have to rely on political processes. You have to rely on people's shame, something that we are lacking in South Africa to a great extent at the moment, the shame of public office bearers. And you have to rely on checks and balances within the political process itself. Judges cannot rush into parliament. So there are <laughs> and, and that's why I react well strongly to, to, uh, to the suggestion that that uh, separation of powers should disable the judiciary, because we have been restrained in South Africa. We have relied on the political process, except when it is fully broken down. So to, to answer our, our, our interlocutor's question, I don't think a, a constitutional amendment is going to help. We've got a wonderful constitution. We've got wonderful legislation in South Africa. We need them implemented. And judges can't see to the implementation of, of legislation. They have to rely on other agencies of goodwill, of commitment and competence to do that. And we have to admit that that is lacking in South Africa at the moment. Yep, and I think it's, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's being shown up in democracies across the world, as you, as you, as you mentioned in your speech. Um, I think we have another question uh, where an anonymous attendee asks, uh, and this is a question of around appointments. Uh, and what would you say about the role of a member of an independent inquiry commission and the constitutional safeguards that are necessary relating to their appointment, composition, and powers? And, and I'd like to expand on that a little bit as well. Uh, and, and, and to expand it to appointment of judges of the Constitutional Court, as, and as South Africa, as our audience would know, as it has the process of the JAC, the Judicial Appointments Commission, uh, a very robust, uh, live, uh, transparent, but political uh, process uh, of appointment. So how do you see the role of government in appointment of judges, as well as appointment of independent inquiry commissions that are going to look into actions of government? Yes, it, it's another absolutely central question. You can't police everything. The judiciary can't take over everything. I say this with, with humble knowledge of the fact that the Supreme Court of India itself nominates those uh, who, who are, who are to, to succeed, to accede to it. Uh, I think government does have a legitimate role in the appointment of, of, of judges. Our Judicial Service Commission, unfortunately, has become heavily politicized the public interviews of some very capable candidates for judicial uh, uh, appointment have become uh, um, spectacles often of terror and degradation where people are unnecessarily humiliated by posturing politicians. So uh, while we, we, I don't think we've got the balance entirely right in South Africa with the Judicial Service Commission, which is politician and politician nominee dominated, but that government has a, a role uh, is undoubtedly so, also in the appointment of, of, of commissions of inquiry. And that's why the state capture issue was so important in South Africa. If government is captured by unscrupulous predators, as happened under Zuma, then the judiciary can't go and rescue government. You need a capable, honest government. That's right. And I think. Uh as we've heard a number of times by a number of people, as in a, a constitution is only as good as the people who work it. So at the end of the day, we do need honest government and, and there's very little recourse if we don't. Uh, there's an interesting question from Debashish Das, uh, who asks, what institutional mechanisms would you suggest to have judges being ideologically neutral? And perhaps you can, you can contest the premise of that question as well, if you'd like to. It's such a painful issue. Uh, to me, it's a painful issue where it, it, it's, it's a much despised issue uh, about open-mindedness. You, you have in the United States Supreme Court five 
appointees who appear to have been appointed with a hard right, far right wing agenda. Uh, and I, I can honestly say that, that while I have predispositions and they are liberal and they are social justice oriented, I never entered a case with a preconceived agenda which compelled an outcome. Uh, scandalously, one of the hard right predecessors of the present majority in the United States Supreme Court, Justice Antonin Scalia, said not once, but twice, he said, I don't even have to read the briefs in most of the cases because I already know the answer. Well, if you already know the answer, what is the process of rationality of the argument about values? I, I don't know the answers to, to, uh, to, to abortion. I don't know the answers to transgenderism, uh, an issue deeply rooted in, in, uh, in, in Indian culture and history. I don't know the answers to religion, uh, but I, I, I can better understand the answers if I keep an open mind when they argue before me. And that appears less to be happening in the United States Supreme Court. That's great. Let's change tack a little bit because I think you, uh, you spoke about not being ideologically neutral. And I think perhaps ideological neutral, neutrality itself is a bit illusory. I don't think anyone is ideologically neutral. Uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting question from Aditya Bhattacharya who says that uh, you, you've submitted an amicus brief in support of the petition to liberate Happy the Elephant uh, from the Bronx Zoo. Uh, but he asks, could you share some thoughts on how non-human persons can be accommodated within the constitutional text? And how would you respond to lawyers or perhaps judges like say Justice Scalia, who would balk at this thought, uh, perhaps, who prefer to read constitutions very conservatively? I love that question. Thank you very much for selecting it. Uh, and I want to be provocative. I, I want to speak about the contempt that white people like myself held for Indian people, the way that the, the Raj would not have uh, be, be, been, been possible without the implicit subordination of, of, of Indian people below the, the white colonialists. Slavery would not have been possible without the ideology that black people were subhuman, that they weren't fully human, two thirds for every person, every slave in, 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 in the founding states of the United States of America when, 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 when the counting was done. And that's my way of getting to the question you asked, which is there is a movement in the United States to embrace sentient beings who can experience suffering within the plethora of rights, not equal rights. Children don't have equal rights, they don't vote. They don't have autonomy about all their medical choices and decisions. They can't marry. Uh, so, but that a, an appropriate legal expansion should occur, not on the basis of bogus uh, features of humanism or humanoidism, but on the capacity to suffer. I remember my very first uh, visit to India, which was in... January 1999, uh, we had an exhausting day of, of, of seminars run by the Mumbai Lawyers Collective. Uh, Anand Grover is a very tough taskmaster, Justice Michael Kirby, my mentor, is inexhaustible. And I sat down in the hotel reception rooms for a cup of tea and a sandwich. And the waiter said to me, veg or non-veg? I'd never heard. I know that meat eating has increased enormously in India as the middle classes have grown and as prosperity has grown. It's a great, great grief to me that that has happened. Uh, and I think that we, we, we have to bear in mind that the modern process of meat extraction for human consumption from living sentient feeling uh, uh, beings like ourselves is monstrously cruel. And I hope that we can, we can expand in South Africa, we expanded legal uh, consideration to include all people in 1994. We hadn't before apartheid degraded and subordinated the black people. And I hope that by analogy, we can eventually do that with sentient beings in an appropriate way. That's great. 
Um, and I, I very much echo that echo that sentiment. Uh, there's a there's a question from uh, G. S. Patel, Justice Patel, uh, and he writes in an article in the New Yorker on the 26th of November. Adam Gopnik has written, and he quotes: "The power of the Constitution is identical with our commitment to it." Unquote. Uh, uh, but tyrannical governments everywhere seek legitimacy precisely by laying claim to the so-called constitutionality of their regimes. Is this a specific challenge that you see coming up in the years ahead before constitutional courts to ensure that this commitment remains available to the people? I think it does. And, and I also think while, while, while you were asking that question, Mr. Program Director, I was thinking of text. Text is also important. If you look at the ways in which text has been distorted for hard right uh, pre-conceived agenda item uh, outcomes in the United States uh, and text is disregarded. No one, uh, if you take the meaning of words and the content of, of aspirations and values seriously, you can't disregard text. So I think that while governments claim legitimacy and obviously invoke constitutions in order to justify the exercises of power, uh, some of those claims should rightly be treated with greater skepticism than other claims. There are cases where uh, difference is legitimate, and there are other cases where government's invocation, like Stalin in 1936, the most wonderful constitution enacted in, 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 in Russia in 1936, while people were being dragged off to, to mass, mass extermination in Stalin's uh, camps. So uh, I think that one has to, again, we go back to how you implement it. It's not only words, words are important. It's not only constitutional text, it's also commitment and seriousness of purpose and honesty and integrity and humility. That's right. And I, I, I think I'm just gonna bunch a couple of questions together so that we can uh, get through as many as possible. Uh, so uh, th there's a set of questions around the role of doctrine uh, in constitutional interpretation. Uh, and, and I think if I can paraphrase a couple, uh, Gaurav Kumar says that uh, doc unwritten principles or like democracy and federalism have been used as doctrines. I think they've been used in India as part of the basic structure doctrine uh, of the Indian constitution to invalidate constitutional amendment. And he makes reference to the Canadian Supreme Court also saying that these are parts of the constitution, but cannot be used to invalidate statutory legislation. And there is another principle here uh, in terms of public morality. Now public morality is, uh, or morality rather, is uh, an exception to the right to free speech under the Indian constitution that the state can make law uh, in pursuance of morality uh, the, 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 high, the first the High Court of Delhi and then the Supreme Court has said that we need to understand morality as the doctrine of constitutional morality. Uh, so there is this question which keeps coming up that there are doctrines which are uh, espoused by judges uh, in order to interpret text. Uh, and sometimes those doctrines are used uh, to invalidate legislation. In India's case, sometimes they're used to invalidate constitutional amendments. Uh, given the fact that doctrines can be somewhat vague when they begin their journey as a doctrine, in your view, as a, as a long-serving judge, how do you see the role of doctrine in constitutional interpretation, particularly as a device to invalidate legislation? I want to duck that question because I don't know <laughs> enough about it. But let me say this. The South African constitution nowhere actually mentions the separation of powers. It's an implicit doctrine. It's a good example, because if you look at the whole structure, you cannot but conclude that there is a separation between legislature, executive, and judiciary, that the judiciary uh, in its oversight role has to check the other two branches and uh, exhort them to fulfill their role. So I think it depends on the doctrine. I don't want to give an abstract answer, but it's, I know it's a vibrant debate uh, in India, uh, and I can't really say much more than, the, 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 than I've said. Uh, whether it can be used to strike down, I can't see why an implicit doctrine which flows from the structure and text and meaning of the constitution. We deal 
almost all the time with inexplicit meanings. Contested cases that come before all courts deal with inexplicit meanings. We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, uh, Justice Cameron. Uh, I think. I'm sorry. Is is it is it? Am I breaking up? Let me just see if it's my Wi-Fi. No, my Wi-Fi is on. Uh, can you hear me now? We may have frozen. Uh, 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 no, no, sir. We can hear you. Uh, there oh, is good. a network problem from other side. Oh, excellent. Now I was just saying that two things, which is that inexplicit doctrines can be as powerful as explicit doctrines, and I derive that proposition from the fact that most contested issues about language uh, concern their inexplicit meaning. I think we've lost our program director. We can hijack the proceedings without him. Dr. Sen Gupta? Is there someone else from VD who can uh, take over proceedings? I can try to look at the questions in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Very difficult questions. Uh, how can we save our constitution? There is an apprehension in India that the parliament through full majority of a particular religious ideology may change the constitution. They will change the basic structure of it, which will support only those in the majority. Well, if that happens, it will be a, a, a sad setback for the intrinsic nature of, of constitutionalism, which entails, I think, in its deepest structure, uh, permissive arrangements and allowance for minorities, religious, linguistic, and other minorities. Dr. Sengupta, we were I'm, about I'm to- I'm sorry about to, that. I had an out, outage at my end, so- I We were going that, to hijack your session and pirate your event. I would have been the happiest person. Uh, uh, it would have been a Stockholm syndrome kind of case. Would have been very happy with my hijacker. But, but thank you very much for continuing uh, in my absence. There was only one last question that I was going to take, uh, and which was the first question that was asked. Um, and it was asked by a gentleman named Bhaskar. And I think he said, uh, how, and I can't see these questions, so I'm saying this from memory, is how can we save our constitution? And I think this is a, this is a question which, which I think you can reflect on, uh, because uh, as you started, uh, when you started, you said that there are challenges everywhere. Uh, and by everywhere, I mean established democracies like the United States, um, uh, fledgling democracies like India and South Africa. There was a question which I couldn't take from my tray. Uh, my colleague was talking about um, LGBT rights and the problem that homosexual persons face in other parts of Africa, apart from South Africa, um, where, where the situation is much more dire. So there are challenges that people face everywhere, uh, despite constitutional texts promising them a better life, a better future. So how do we, as citizens of countries, not as judges, as citizens of a country, uh, do our bit to save the constitution? I, I think the, the first premise is one's own capacity and one's own agency. There's nothing that cannot be done with sufficient commitment and sufficient determination. I did start answering that question in, when we pirated and, and, and overtook uh, your, your event. Uh, I started answering it by saying that if there were no longer respect, I think pivotal to the rule of law, to constitutionalism, to reasoned government, to, 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 to civilized government is the notion of restraint, that I restrain myself in my excesses and my desires, that I restrain my wish to subordinate you and to suppress you and to, and, and, and to enslave you. That, that notion of restraint also operates constitutionally, that you, that, that you have to have restraint intrinsic to the idea of ordered government. And if the majority abandons that legislatively as the questioner feared, because I read his question while you were away, 
If the majority abandons that restraint, it will be a very, very sad day for the world's most precious and largest functioning democracy. Well, I think uh, that's a, that's a, uh, an apt and somber note uh, to, to end this. It is eight o'clock. I know there were a few more questions. I'm, I'm afraid at this point of time, uh, we- Dr. Stay... Singhgutta, may I, may I just steal another 30 seconds? Yes, please. Your democracy has been through profound crises and it has rebounded. And I believe that both our democracies will because we have the capacity, we have the non-governmental and civil society organizations, we have free media. So having ended on a somber note, I want to, uh, go forward on an affirming note for both India and South Africa. Thank you. And that's wonderful because this is a note of optimism that, that makes it a much more fitting end uh, because I was going away uh, rather cynically like an academic thinking about what needs to be done. Uh, now I go with hope of what we can do and what we can achieve. And I think that's been the spirit of your lecture, Justice Cameron, that there are dark times, but there are is always a light at the end of the tunnel and we must find it. And you have shown us a way, not only through your lecture today, but through your work, first as a lawyer, then as a judge for many, many years in terms of speaking truth to power and with humility, which is a theme that you harped on through the course of your lecture with humility and with restraint and respect, even for those whom we may oppose. Uh, so once again, on behalf of everybody at Vidhi and the audience, I'd like to thank you, Justice Cameron, for taking out your time and being with us today. Uh, I know that I really wish this could have been your seventh visit to the country, uh, but unfortunately, where we are, uh, this is uh, going to be a this was a virtual visit. But I'm still delighted that you could make it. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, for coming and for those really, really inspiring words. I'd like to thank my colleague Rahul Bajaj, who made this possible. Uh, Rahul is a, is a wonderfully inspiring young legal academic uh, and Rhodes Scholar. And, and thank you very much, Rahul, for, for, for all the effort in making this happen. To my team at Vidhi, who did all the technicalities, the logistics of putting this all together. Uh, I'm sorry that there was a little bit of outage at my end, uh, but thank you for, for putting this together, uh, the wonderful team uh, at Vidhi. And finally, thanks to everyone, the members of our audience, um, the judges of various high courts, former judges of the Supreme Court, and the members of the audience, thank you very much uh, for coming as on, a, on a holiday evening uh, to listen to this lecture and renew our commitment to the Constitution itself. Uh, so once again, on behalf of everyone at Vidhi, thank you for coming. A happy Republic Day to everyone. And once again, to Justice Cameron, thank you very much. Good night to everyone.